I want to start with a story, a true story, about a 19-year-old uh, girl who had a friend who was a boy. Not a boyfriend, a friend who was a boy. Uh, who she thought was a rather interesting friend. And uh, it so happened that one 4th of July, this friend who was a boy came to spend 4th of July with her family. And they, they went together and they did the 4th of July things. And it was fun. And at the end of the evening, as they were parked in her driveway, the friend who was a boy said to her, I love the way I learn when I'm with you. I would like to get to know you better. You are precious to me. When she heard, you are precious to me, she came to realize that this was not a boy who was a friend. The whole nature of the relationship changed with those words because she recognized that this was a special relationship, a relationship of deep love, of deep care, of cherishing. And so I want to explore this idea. You are precious to me. If you have your Bible with you, you can turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I bet you weren't expecting that. We've been in 1 Thessalonians for a while. Uh, Pastor Tim has been preaching out of this, and we're going to continue right from where he left off. So I'm going to read it through right now and then give you the roadmap for our sermon this morning. I'm going to start in 2.17 and read through 3.5. But, brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought. Out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly, I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So, when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service, in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as well you know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what I'd like to do this morning is take you through uh, this story through a few steps. First, I want to give you some context because that's what I always do. And because this is part of a narrative. Paul's talking about, oh, when we were there, we did this, and you know that that happened. But we aren't the Thessalonians, so we don't really remember it like it was yesterday, as the people he was writing to did. So what I want to do is I want to give you the context. I want to tell a little bit of the story of Paul in Thessalonica. After we do the story of Paul in Thessalonica, we're going to sort of walk through the text and just point out some things. And finally, I want to take this text and take the heart of this text and put it down into our own hearts. So those are the three things we're going to do today. So first, let's talk about the story of Paul in Thessalonica. Paul took three missionary journeys, as all of you Bible nerds know. This was on his second missionary journey, and he came through Philippi, and he heard, he saw in a dream... Come to Macedonia. We need you in Macedonia. Thessalonica is one of the towns in Macedonia. So he heard a dream, told him to come. He came. After he got kicked out of Philippi, he went to Thessalonica. It says that he spent three days. I'm sorry if you're not a map person. I'm a map person. So you start out Philippi up there in the top, and then he goes over a bit left to Thessalonica. 
right? And later we'll make it down to Berea, just over on the left, and then Athens. So you can leave that up. If you're a map person, you'll enjoy it. If you're not, just ignore it. I'm a map person. So in Philippi, he was kicked out. He came to Thessalonica. And it says that he came spending three Sabbaths reasoning with the Jewish leaders in the synagogue. Now, if he was spending his Sabbaths reasoning in the synagogue, what was he spending his, the rest of his time doing? Well, we learn from the book of 1 Thessalonians that he was working. Paul had a job. He made tents. And uh, as we read last week when Pastor Tim was preaching to us, he said... Ooh, where did, I, where did it go? Surely you remember our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. That's in verse 9, chapter 2, verse 9. So Paul was working, but it says, while we preach the word of God to you. So Paul wasn't just sitting in his little workshop by himself, sewing tents together. He was sitting in his workshop, sewing tents together with these people from Thessalonica who had heard him when he was preaching on the Sabbath and said, we want to know more. Tell us more about this Jesus. So what did he tell them? Well, you can read in Acts, you can read in Romans, you can read in Galatians the content of what Paul's message always was. And it's something to the effect of this, that we have all made mistakes. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the life we are to live. But that God, because of his love for us and his desire to be with us, sent someone to bring us to him, sent the person Jesus, sent the person Jesus who was in fact God come to us to gather us back into him. And so, instead of trusting in your own abilities, if you trust in Jesus for your righteousness, then Jesus can bring you to be with the Father, and we can spend an eternity together with the Father and with one another. And this was a strange teaching. This was a new teaching. And so, for three weeks, he was teaching this new teaching to the people in Thessalonica who listened with eager ears. But after three weeks, the... uh, Acts says that the leaders of the Jewish synagogue became jealous and caused a riot and raised up all the people against Paul and his preaching. And they went and found Jason, uh, who owned the house where Paul would spend the nights. They couldn't find Paul. I'm thinking he was in his workshop. But they couldn't find Paul, so they found Jason, his host, dragged Jason and a couple other people down and threw them in jail. Um, And... So even the, the civil authorities, the, the Romans and the Jewish people, the Greeks were the locals, they all combined together and said, this is trouble. We don't want this guy here. They're declaring another king, the King Jesus, instead of the, the rightful King Caesar. So we need to throw them in jail. And so the persecution began while Paul was still there. So much so that Paul had to flee and he fled to Berea. We've got the map still. He fled to Berea. He couldn't stay in Berea long, though. If you are a Bible nerd, you know that in Berea, the people who were listening to him got excited and they searched the scriptures, you know, fearlessly and thoroughly to see if this new teaching that he was teaching was true. But he had to run away from Berea because the people from Thessalonica chased him all the way to Berea and chased Paul out of Berea. And he fled all the way to Athens. So he fled all the way to Athens and feels this separation from the people he left in Thessalonica. That's the context. He had shared with him this story of Jesus, but he didn't know how they had responded. He knew how the people had treated him, so he could only imagine how the people of Thessalonica were treating those he left behind. So his heart burned for them. So let's go through this passage slowly, looking at these pictures of how Paul, Paul's heart burned for them. Um, go ahead and put the scripture up, 217. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time. 
Okay, I have to rewind the script just a second. We were orphaned. This is this serious separation that Paul's talking about. How long had he known these people? Three weeks. These are not like his, his lifelong best buddies from childhood. Paul had been on missionary journeys before. He'd visited churches before. Um, he went to Iconium and Lystra and Derby on his first missionary trip. And then like three years before, and then he sent a letter to them two years before, and then he visited them again on this trip, and he went through and actually picked up Timothy from one of them. We don't see him saying this about people he's known forever. We see him pouring out this affection for people he had known for only three weeks. Where does he get this heart? But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned, by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. Have you, were you ever a kid? When you were a kid, did you ever get left behind by your parents? It happened to me at Great America, which is now a Six Flags in Santa Clara, California, and, uh, you know, mom had done the whole routine. If you get lost, you go find somebody wearing a uniform and tell them, I'm lost, I can't find my parents, and then they'll do the thing on the intercom and your parent will come and find you. And I remember sort of, you know, oh, okay, I found the person in the uniform, they took me, and you're just sitting there on the bench with a lollipop <laughs> waiting for somebody to come find you. It's a horrible feeling. That's just a small picture of being orphaned. That's the language that Paul is using to say what he was experiencing at the loss of this new family that he'd only known for three weeks. Let's go on. He talks about out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. So I told you that he left and went to Berea. He might have been trying to go back to Thessalonica, and maybe that's why the Thessalonians came and chased them out. When we put this map up, it's a map of Greece, and I have a picture in my head of Greece being a small country. Probably because whenever I look at a map of Greece, it's like a map of the whole Mediterranean, and Greece is like that big. The distance from Thessalonica to Athens, if you were to walk it, is 250 miles. We made every effort to go back and see you because of the intense longing that we had for you. Paul really cares about these folks. I'm going to keep reading. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again. But Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Back in the original Olympic Games in Greek times, when you won, you did not get a medal. You got a crown, a crown of, of laurel or some sort of branch tied together. You got a crown. And so that was the sign of your achievement. When a Roman uh, general came back as a victorious conqueror, they put a crown on his head, and there were different ones. You got the white one if you were really good. You got the crimson one if you were so-so. You just got laurel wreath. Anyway, there were grades of crowns. And so Paul's using contemporary language of like getting a gold medal or getting a, a medal for bravery. It's an accomplishment. So he's saying, what is our accomplishment? It's you. There's language in Scripture about the crown we're going to have in heaven. And honestly, I don't think I'd look good in a crown. I'm not that interested in a piece of metal in a circle that has jewels on it that I have to wear all the time. I'm not a hat guy. I think that what Paul is opening up to us here is that he's using crown as a metaphor for relationships. My crown, my glory, when Jesus comes again, is all of you. I get to stand here on Sunday mornings when I preach and look out at all of you. And I love you guys. And when I go to heaven, I will see you. 
and I will have a relationship with you. Isn't that my hope? Isn't that my joy and my glory? Amen. And so that is what we get to look forward to as believers. This hope of, of seeing one another, of being in relationship one another. My heart beats for each of you. I'm so glad that you are here, part of our Can Be Alliance family. Or even if you're visiting, I'm glad you're here visiting. It's good to see you. Thank you, Joanna. And so, what we see here is a bit of Paul's pastor heart. I'm going to keep going and read just a little more. So when we could not stand it any longer, oh, when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials, for you know quite well that we are destined for them. So when he left... The people who were left behind in Thessalonica endured trials. We know that Jason had been thrown in jail and forced to post bond, and so then he left. I don't know what his bond was. Maybe he had to put up his livelihood. Maybe he didn't have any money to feed his family so that the other folks in this baby church had to come together and make the food to feed Jason's family. I don't know the situation, but he had been, uh, Paul had been months away from them and was worried, so he sent Timothy back to them. And if you read ahead one verse past where my section is here, Timothy had come back with a good report that these Thessalonians were still holding on to the gospel despite the persecution that they had heard about. Thanks be to God. So Paul is pouring out this love and affection language to these people in the midst of their trials and suffering. I think that's why this morning when I prayed for the congregation, I was praying for those who are suffering because God's trying to touch my heart with this passage for all of you who, are, who might be experiencing suffering. Suffering I know about and suffering I don't know about. I want to know how you're doing and I want to make sure you're okay. Let's read on. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. He couldn't stand it. He had a team traveling with him of probably three guys, and he said, okay, I can't handle it. We're sending Timothy back. We've got, we've got to find out how the Thessalonians are doing. I know it's 250 miles but we're going to send Timothy back and we're going to stay here and wait for Timothy to get back. So Paul stayed in Athens, sent Timothy back. Timothy comes with a good report and now Paul's writing a message back to them saying, oh, thanks be to God that you are still following Jesus. So I told you that I love all of you because Paul, we see this picture of Paul loving all of these Thessalonians. That's Paul's pastor heart. We've been blessed as a church for years of Tim's pastor heart. And so I love that we have this picture of Paul and of Tim as pastor hearts, where they have this outpouring of love and care and concern for each of us in the midst of our trials. That's why we hope as a church, when you're experiencing hardship, you contact the office. We can put it on the prayer sheet or we can just have a pastor come visit with you or a member of the women's prayer team or an elder because we're worried about you if you're having a hard time. It's always a bummer when we hear, oh, they've been sick for three months. Ah, <laughs> let us pray for you. But that said, you aren't able to share everything. Sometimes things are too personal. You can find brothers and sisters who you know in this congregation or who you can trust in Christ and reach out to them. And they can reach out with their pastor's heart to you. You know who's safe in your sphere, in your circle, who you can trust with your challenges. Find trusted people who can pray with you and pray for you. 
But ultimately, I'm not all that interested in Paul's heart. I'm not all that interested in pastors' hearts. I'm interested in where that comes from, which is from God's heart. Where does love come if not from God? The God who created the universe, the God who came down to be with you, says to you, you are precious to me. You are precious to me. On your best day, on your worst day, you are precious to me. When Paul, I mean, we've been talking about Paul. When Paul was a little kid, knee high to a grasshopper, Paul, God looked at Paul and said, you are precious to me. When Paul was growing up, a student to Gamaliel, learning how to be a Pharisee, God said, you are precious to me. When Paul was present at the stoning of Stephen, holding all the cloaks of everybody who was there, keeping watch over them while they stoned Stephen to death, God said to Paul, you are precious to me. When Paul was on the road to Tarsus, the road to Damascus, thank you. This is why we need each other. When Paul was on the road to Damascus and a blinding light came from God and God blinded him and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's because Paul was precious to him. And three days later, when God healed him from his blindness, God says, you are precious to me. When Paul's going on missionary journeys, when Paul's a nobody, God says, you are precious to me. So when you look at your own life and you think of your childhood, you think of your teenager years, your adulthood, God is saying at every point, at the high point, at the low point, you are precious to me. And today, God is saying to you, you are precious to me. I don't know what God's love is going to do to you today. But I have a few ideas of how we as believers can participate in God's love. We participate in God's love when we allow God's love to flow through us to others. We participate in God's love when we just sit with God and allow God's love to flow into us. I have just a couple ideas that really came to me over the past 24 hours about what it is to receive God's love. This is an exercise you can try if you like it. You can also ignore it if you don't. Oftentimes, when I get in bed and I'm lying in bed, I will just try an image of God's love on. I'll, I'll, do a, I'll just visualize it. And there are two that I've used. One is of me lying in a pool. I love water. And just sort of that pool is God's love. And I just sort of allow myself to gradually sink into God's love. Maybe I start just sitting on the surface and then I go to where I'm half in and I go to where I'm all in or my nose is sticking out or I go... I, I like being underwater, so I go to where I can be underwater and I'm just breathing in and out God's love. And that image for me is just a comforting image of remembering the love that God has for me. Or if you're not a water person, maybe you're lying in a beautiful field, just lying on the grass under the sun, and you start to evaporate and the atmosphere is God's love. And first your skin evaporates, and then your muscles evaporate, and then your bones evaporate until your beating heart sort of flies up into the golden sun that is God's love. And your heart, it basks in God's love. The last one is one that I'm stealing from somebody else that they shared with me. And they said, think of God, a big, you know, God with a body, much bigger than you, and a giant heart, like the size of, of a sanctuary or of a city or of a continent, whichever works best for you. And imagine yourself in the center of that beating heart, because that is where you are. 
in the center of God's love. And so you might try that this week as you lie in bed or as you sit somewhere drinking coffee because that is where we are. We are creatures loved by God who have the joy of participating in God's love. This morning, we're going to have an opportunity to participate in God's love. This morning, we're going to go into communion right now. Because in communion, we come to the table where we see the bread that represents Christ's body and the juice that represents Christ's blood that remind us of God's love for us, the God who came down to be with us. No man hath greater love than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. How blessed are we that we have been given the power to be called children of God. And that is what we are. So we're going to transition right now to communion time for you to participate in God's love that way. We have prepackaged communion at the back. If you're on this half of the sanctuary, I invite you to the table here. If you're on this half of the sanctuary, I invite you to the table over on the side. And we will just take this time uh, in... Do we have music, uh, Josh? No? Yeah? Josh will play some music just to give you some space. Go ahead, take your time, come up, um, get the tray when you're ready. If you want to sit in your seat and pray first, that's great. Take it back to your seat. You can sit and pray. We'll give an extended time of, of communion here for you to just sit in God's love, and then we'll end the service with a song. Thank you. Come. The table is for you.